permit something to happen. Um, before we get into the lesson, though, uh, let's uh, have a prayer. Father, we thank you so very much for all you do for us. We thank you for times like this, that in the middle of the week when we uh, sometimes are uh, taken back by uh, the things of the world, by uh, trivial things and by uh, mundane things, it's good to get away and come here and think about your word, to meet with other people and uh, try to encourage and be encouraged. Pray a special blessing on us tonight as we uh, look at the idea of empowerment, that we can uh, really understand um, what your will for us is and how we can fit into that will and how we can alter our lives to conform to that will. So be with us in our study and help us always to be drawn closer to you. We pray through Christ. Amen. To authorize or to um, equip someone uh, is usually what I think of when I think of empowering someone. In the, paper, in the uh, front page of the uh, Tulsa World yesterday, on the front page editorial, I noticed a paragraph though, and I'm not going to be quoting verbatim, but in essence it said that if you don't vote, you empower the wrong kind of people to run the place. Uh, by not voting, you empower other people uh, in, in their uh, quest to elect their officer, offices and um, pass the, uh, any questions that they want to uh, pass. Uh, another way of it used in this sense, it may be um, someone, well, say, um, had a lot of money, said his wealth empowered him to uh, do many good works. Uh, so it's just a kind of a subtle thing, but it isn't really a definite authorization. Last week, Tim uh, mentioned that they had gone to court to get guardianship for um, Coleman. In that situation, the courts empowered Kim and Tim to uh, act on uh, Coleman's behalf. We elect our officials uh, to offices and we empower them to pass legislation. Uh, sometimes, when I was retired, I know we're talking a lot about empowering employees. And we, um, by that, we meant we give them a job to do, and then we give them the resources and the equipment to do that job. We, we don't, don't leave them stranded and left to their own devices. You, you give someone a job and then give them the power to do that. You give them the equipment they need, you give them the resources they need, and so that's the sense in which um, I usually think of empowering. In the, um, I think I've got a clicker here. I'm going to uh, first have a few examples of empowerment in 2 Corinthians, uh, the 12th chapter, Paul is writing, says, My grace is sufficient for you. This is Christ speaking to Paul. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast, Paul's now talking, therefore I will uh, boast all the more greatly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In context, he's talking about his thorn in the flesh. And he says, although he doesn't use the word empower, the idea is that Christ has empowered him to go ahead and compensate for his weaknesses. He has weaknesses, but he doesn't, it doesn't get him down because Christ has empowered him. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the, the circumstances. 
I know what, is, what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned as the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things, all this, through a him who gives me the strength. Christ empowered us, empowers us sometimes to have plenty or have need, but yet we can still have the power to be content. We, we're, we're not uh, set back because of our circumstances. So empowerment can sometimes allow us to overcome weaknesses. It can allow us or provide for us to be content, whatever happens. And in writing to Timothy, Timothy was, was a young preacher, and Paul was urging him uh, to do the work of an evangelist and to uh, proclaim the gospel and not be afraid in doing so. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave, gave us, for the Spirit God gave us, does not make it make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Some translations here says God does not give us a, the a spirit of timidity, or one of them says the spirit of fear. The word here sometimes is translated timid or timidity, sometimes fear. Um, I believe it was Max Lucado that, where I first read this, said that the most frequently given command in the Bible is fear not or do not fear. And Paul is saying Christ empowers us so that we won't have fear, we won't have to be timid, it kind of harkens back to the writer of the Hebrew letter when he uh, said that we now have boldness to come in before God, you know, talking about the priests who somewhat hesitantly, hesitantly sometimes went into the uh, most holy place once a year. He's saying that we have boldness. We're not timid about it now because of what Christ has done for us. He's empowered us to not have this timidity or this fear. And I think that in our lives, so many, so many times, we fail to heed the admonition, fear not, do not fear. See, so, well, this is uh, speaking about temptation and the, uh, our falling. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide, also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God's going to empower us in times of temptation. We don't have to be uh, concerned that something's going to overcome us or overtake us that we just can't stand. He's going to empower us to meet whatever situation comes our way. And then Peter also speaks of this in First uh, Peter 2 and 3. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. One of the translations says he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. Reminds us of, of Christ's statement that he, he made when he said that I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He came to give us the abundant life. You know, if Peter had just said, he's given us everything we need for life, and just stopped there, 
it would be easy to say, well, he's talking about eternal life. But he also ties it with godliness, our actions. He's saying he's given us power to live in the here and now, not just looking for the hereafter, but the here and now. He's empowered us for everything we need for life and godliness. Um, when I think of that uh, idea of the, the here and now instead of the hereafter, I may be um, saying this wrong, but I, I think about Martha after Lazarus' death when Jesus said uh, he will live again. He said, she said, I know he will in the resurrection. She had faith that in the hereafter things would be okay, but she had a little bit of trouble facing the here and now. But Peter is saying that Christ has empowered us to live the here and now, not just the hereafter. In order to have this empowerment, though, first I, I think we need to uh, know Christ. After Jesus said this, this is at the uh, last uh, supper with his disciples, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority, you've empowered him, you've granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know God. To know God is to have eternal life. Paul echoed somewhat this same thought when he said, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteous righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. To know Christ is to be able to be empowered by Christ. Now, knowing someone in uh, the biblical usage of that word usually implies a relationship. Uh, even deeper, it sometimes it implies an experience with it. It's not knowing about someone. If we want to be empowered by Christ, we need to know Christ. We know someone not by reading about them, but by talking with them, by listening to them, by having experiences with them. And so knowing Christ is not knowing about Christ, but it has to do with our everyday life. I've asked David to lead uh, a song here, uh, Jesus, let us come to know you. Uh, 
time uh, this evening uh, looking at the book of Ephesians and so um, we, we want um, to uh, read Philippian, uh, Ephesians 1 verses 15 through it says 28 I believe it's supposed to be 23 um, for this reason ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his uh, holy people and the incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he, as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fits everything, who fills everything in every way. In this uh, section, I wanted to especially notice um, the 19th and 20th uh, verses here. If I can find it. I could go back and bring it up there. I guess I'll try to do that. Yeah, 19 and 20. In, in the 19th verse, it's interesting, some of the uh, wording that he uh, gives here. In the NIV, it uh, reads, his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength. Um, the Christian Standard uh, Bible uh, words that a little bit differently and what is the imma and and to also know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength there are four words here and the rv i believe actually lists uh, each one se separately um, but there's power uh, as has been pointed out several times the same root word that we get our word dynamite from. Um, there is working, and that's the same root word that we get our word energy from. It seems to be uh, stating that power is of any use only when it works. No use having this power if it's not going to do anything. He also uses a couple of other words, might or mighty and strength. So in this verse, I, I think we get the, the idea of the, the mighty power that God has. But then he says that that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms. 
seated Christ at, the, at his right hand. You know, sometimes we might wonder uh, if the preaching about the resurrection is really all that critical or not. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul lets, lets us know that if Christ isn't raised from the dead, our faith is useless. That's what it's all about. So, well, well, what's so important about that? But one thing, it does show his power. It shows that once he decides to do something, he can do it. Jesus has said that he was going to establish his kingdom and the gates of Hades or gates of hell would not prevent it. No matter what the devil threw at him, God was going to overcome it. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ shows that even from the beginning, God's plan was going to come into force. He was going to be able to accomplish his will. He, he formed a nation. He, that nation many times you know, sinned against him. They, they, he had all kinds of trouble with, with the, uh, the nation, but he did everything to bring about the coming of Christ. And his mighty power is exhibited when Christ accomplished his mission. The church wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't a, a something that he came up with because he was thwarted in what he really wanted to do. This was all in God's plan and God's power. And so the mighty power of God is demonstrated in the resurrection of Christ. There's also an expression here that's rather unique in um, the book of uh, Ephesians. The uh, NIV calls it the heavenly realm. Some of the translations says heavenly places uh, one of them says the heavenlies. Um, it could be variously uh, translated, perhaps, but it's mentioned uh, not only here in verse 20, placing Christ and raising him to the heavenly realm, but it's also mentioned uh, four other times. And if, if you've got your Bible open there in uh, first. Uh, Ephesians. They're not going to show these other instances, um, but I will refer to them. We've already seen that Christ had been raised to the heavenly realm. Earlier in the third uh, verse of this same chapter, he mentions that all spiritual blessings are in the heavenly realms. The blessing of uh, salvation from sin, uh, the, the blessing of the abiding presence of Christ, the bless, blessing of the constant cleansing of his blood. Uh, all spiritual blessings are in the heavenly realm. Christ is in the heavenly realm. We're also told in the 10th verse of chapter 3, the church displays God's magnificent wisdom in the, uh, he in the, uh, to the forces in the heavenly realms. To the forces there, he, uh, we read uh, elsewhere that these forces are both evil forces and uh, good forces, both angels and demons, and the church declares the magnificent grandeur of God's wisdom and his power by the fact that it came into existence. It was ordained from the beginning. And now the angels, just as they rejoice on the coming of one sinner that repents, the angels rejoice. The church is manifesting. We are manifesting God's grandeur and his magnificent wisdom in the heavenly places. We're, we're testifying to the angels of that and they're rejoicing because of it. But also there's evil forces in the heavenly places. There's evil uh, forces at work and they're trembling at it, at the manifestation of the church. The fact that the church exists and that we can do God's will is a threat to the demons. So the church displays God's magnificent wisdom to the forces in the heavenly realm. 
in chapter uh, 1, verse 3, um, and that is wrong. That is, um, a, a, uh, is two, that, that's my typing there. Uh, the t second chapter, um, verses 4 and 6. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in, tr in transgression, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. And this is perhaps a little bit uh, confusing here. Um, uh, not necessarily confusing, but uh, rather alarming to me, I mean surprising, that Christ is in the heavenly realm, the spiritual blessings are in the heavenly realm, the church is manifesting the wisdom of God to the forces in the heavenly realm, but we also are in the heavenly realm. All men are created in God's image. That's why we're told that murder is wrong, because we're killing someone that's in God's image. Peter talked about uh, us being in the, reflecting the divine nature. We're, we're told in um, 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4, his divine power, we quoted three a while ago, now we're going to add verse 4 to it. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. All men are in God's image. We are in God's nature. We become children. That uh, harkens back to Jesus uh, talking to Nicodemus. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. We are born again. When Paul talks about our citizen, citizenship being in heaven, it's not just a cliche, it's not just a, a phrase he's using. We are in the heavenly places. There is a war going on in the heavenly places, though. In the uh, 12th chapter, I mean the 12th verse of chapter 6, we, we find that uh, there is a war being raged there. I want to quote um, what that verse actually reads. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So Christ is in the heavenly realm, spiritual blessings are in the heavenly realm, the church is uh, testifying to angels and also to, to the demons, the magnificence of God's wisdom. We are in the heavenly places, but there, because of the evil forces there, there is a spiritual battle going on in the heavenly realm. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, uh, 3 and 4. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war, war as the world does. The we weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, or on the contrary. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolished arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This war began in the garden uh, in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his head, his heel. Uh, Revelation 12.17, then the dragon was enraged at the woman, the church, and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. And then 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, growls, uh, 
prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But we know from reading the book of Revelation and the uh, magnificent language there, some of the uh, beautiful imagery, we know that the victory is going to be ours. We don't have to be concerned about how this outcome is going to be. We're told that the victory is Christ. And we want to sing now, uh, the battle belongs to the Lord. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us can stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the powers of darkness come in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. Raise up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in heart, do not be. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is here. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And this is really um, the lesson for the night. We've, we've been building up to it all this time. Uh, in starting with verse 10 of chapter 6, he's going to give us, okay, what is this equipment? How has Christ empowered us? Now, in the coming weeks and months, as um, Tim and others bring lessons on empowerment, I'm sure uh, two lessons I would think would be having to do with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the power of prayer because, you know, these seem to be the main instruments of power, of empowerment, the, the indwelling of the Spirit and the power of prayer. But in the 10th uh, verse of chapter 6, Paul is going to start in and uh, describe some of the other things that Christ has given us, empowering us to withstand temptation, empowering us to be content in all situations, empowering us to not fear, but to have a spirit of uh, power. In, in this 10th um, verse here, Paul says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, his ploys, his wiles. Our struggle as we've quoted before, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And having done everything to stand, he keeps talking about standing. He wants us to stay in the heavenly realm. He doesn't want us to fall from the heavenly realm. He doesn't want us to... Uh, be uh, captured by, by our enemy. He's saying, stand in the heavenly realm. Stay, stay there. Now he's going to give us some practical tools that we, um, we have to enable us to stand in the heavenly realm. He first talks about the belt. 
and he compares that to truth. The belt for the Roman soldier tied up the uh, flowing uh, tunic or robe uh, for any uh, contest, athletic contest or battle. Um, if there wasn't the belt on, um, the soldier could get entangled in things. And also, it served as a um, place to uh, some of the other equipment uh, attached to the belt. And so uh, the belt was you know, a critical piece of uh, equipment for the Roman soldiers. In fact, it was, uh, it was the first thing they put on after you know, their tunic or the robe. It, they'd put on this belt, and he equates that to truth. Truth is really the reality of things, not a false pretense. It could apply to doctrinal purity or doctrinal truth. It could apply to also, in, in this case, I think it applies to the way we live. It's being true to what we profess to be and not being hypocritical about it, not being something we, uh, professing one thing, but being something else. Be true. Say what you mean and mean what you say and be, uh, have the truth with you. That's going to tie everything together. That's going to keep us from getting entangled in the world if we have the truth as our belt. The breastplate covering the vital organs he uh, compares to righteousness. Now righteousness could be of two different things. It could be what we might refer to as forensic righteousness or righteousness of the law. In the book of Romans, we know that our righteousness comes through Christ. We don't have a righteousness of our own uh, doing. We, we don't uh, have a righteousness because of what we've done. We have the righteousness of Christ. This, um, I, I sometimes uh, tell people to, um, when they see the word righteous or righteousness, if they're having a problem, just think right standing before God. A right relationship with God is righteousness. But also righteousness uh, sometimes means um, our action. Everything that is uh, good and pure and uh, right in doing is, can be uh, translated as righteousness. Um, Jesus used it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, you know, he said, our righteousness should exceed the righteousness of the Pharisee. Don't do your righteousness to be seen of men. He that uh, we should hunger and thirst after righteousness because we'll be a bit filled. The, what's going to protect our uh, heart is going to be our righteousness. So act, so be doing things so that when the wiles of the devil come, we won't be taken back by them. It, he, the word for shoes is not here. It just having, says having your feet shod. Uh, but, uh, the, of course, that implies that we have something on our feet, either shoes or sandals. I understand that uh, the sandals uh, of the Roman soldiers were kind of hobnailed, and Paul has encouraged them to stand. So the, the uh, shoes or the sandals are going to give us some stability. Paul uh, likens that to the preparation of the gospel. Now, the way this is worded, it's, uh, it could be taken two different ways. It could be the preparation or the readiness that the gospel of peace provides for us, or it could mean us taking the gospel of peace to other people. Uh, and then the idea is more of the shoes or the uh, footwear gives us mobility. So I think that both ideas are really involved here. The idea of stability, standing firm, prepared because of the gospel of peace, but also being able to move about and take that gospel of peace to other people. Um, when I think about the uh, gospel of peace, um, I, I think I remember Barclay, I believe, said that uh, peace is simply a right relationship. If we have a right relationship with people, we have peace with them. If we have a right relationship with God, we have peace with God. We also need to have peace with ourselves, um, the peace that passes the understanding um, Paul talks about. And so the um, shoes are, that are going to give us the mo to stability to uh, stand and not fall is going to be the gospel of peace that we have.
you know, it's strange that he would use the expression gospel of peace in the context of warfare. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> but uh, the um, preparation of the gospel, I think, is, uh, again, has two ideas here. Uh, be prepared to take the gospel to other people. Um, someone said we're most safe when we're seeking the safety of others. Um, so I'm also reminded of, of John the Baptist when he was in prison and sent the messenger to uh, Jesus to ask him, are you the one we're looking for? You know, when he came to him when John was preaching and Jesus came, he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He, he didn't have any doubt. But during a period of inactivity, he started having doubts, evidently, it sounds like. And kind of a warning for us, let's be prepared and let's be active and let's be doing things. If we want to fight against the devil, activity for Christ, I think, is one of the uh, main uh, sources of, of empowerment that we'll have. Well, we won't be able to cover all these, but uh, the shield that uh, guards us is the large, not the little round shield, but the large shield. And um, based on Tim's lesson Sunday, I think of the phalanx. When the, uh, with these big shields, the army would interlock them and they stand up against uh, the enemy that way. It not only protects us, um, the faith, our faith does, but linked with other people, having koinonia with those uh, with us, it gives us a solid front against the devil. And the helmet of salvation, uh, the helmet uh, identified them for who they were. Our salvation is going to be that that uh, we wear and it is manifest to the world, to the world around about us. Um, and the sword of the spirit, um, it's the sword that the spirit gives, not the spirit as the sword. And the sword, he said, is the word of God, the rhema, the spoken word or the written word, not the logos, the Christ, the eternal mind of God or the uh, intent of God. God, um, eternal logos is Christ. But here, the word of God is the written word. Jesus used it as a defense against uh, Satan in all of his temptations. We too can use the word of God um, in our uh, battle against the um, Satan. In the coming weeks uh, and months, I'm sure we'll have more lessons, uh, probably more exhaustive lessons uh, concerning the power, but um, let's be sure to uh, always remember that Christ is empowering us. We don't have a spirit of timidity. We have a spirit of power. Thank you. That says my time is up. <laughs>